Cool. John's going to get things set up. If you want to share on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, we'll let you give you a chance to do it now. It looks like we actually Facebook's working today. So that's yes. good. Uh, although we're, we're minus one of our top contributors for the comments. You're obviously here. Uh, <laughs> that's true. What can I say? I'll, I'll keep commenting while I'm here. This guy's you'll ha Yeah, you'll have to you'll have to log into your brother account and uh, yeah, he'll be there that way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We went live at thirty minutes past nine. We went live exactly on time for the first time. Amazing. Wow. And no problems this time. I can't tell you. Yeah. Touch woods. You have two more interviews after this one to get through. So when they get too say too excited. <laughs> Yeah, but then usually Lisa's done, you know, watching everything on Netflix. <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay, I yeah. stream. <laughs> I, I may yeah. not say the same, that's the only thing. <laughs> oh. How's the weather down there? It's pretty dreary up here. Yeah, it's been wall-to-wall -wall rain for about three days now. Um, and we had kind of gale force winds yesterday as well, just to kind of really... Keep us on it's a lovely to go outside with you know when you're cooped up with a small child, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all right. He's he's back at nursery now, so uh, we get at least a couple of days in the week um, where there's not you know a two foot something trying to destroy everything that you've done in your day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are people allowed to come to the state yet, or is it still closed off? Uh, no, it's it's been um, open for quite a while now, and um, the carriage museum where where we are um, and yeah. that's the only build the only kind of interior place that's open as well okay um, so that's all um you know doing all the track and trace kind of uh, checks on everyone when they come in and uh, so i can it was quite nice during lockdown because i obviously had that whole courtyard to myself and could let fernley run wild yeah, exactly. sit, sit there drink a coffee and read uh, read a book and he was you know penned in Whereas now, not so much. <laughs> well, I was talking to Peter Chen earlier, and uh, he said he was quite jealous that I got to go and hang out with you. And uh, he said the estate looks amazing. So maybe one of these days we can all get together and go hang out for a, for a beer. <laughs> yeah. Do that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> How's the fishing been? I keep seeing it in the pictures. Yeah, well, I, I kind of, obviously the season ended on... Wednesday, Wednesday just gone. Um, right. So yeah, had a had an all right last week. My brother came came over from Norfolk, and we got uh, four days in, uh, three different three different two rivers and a reservoir, um, and we caught at every location. Um, so that's not bad at all. It's not bad for for the end of September. Um, yeah. So how long have you been fly fishing then? Uh, well, I've only recently got back into it um, this year, um, but I was, uh, I used to go up to um, Scotland with my, to see my uncle, I, you know, blimey, probably since I was about six, we had, had to go with the rods. Um, and then when he passed away, um, really, it wasn't, and living in East Anglia at the time, it's not really fly fishing in East Anglia, <laughs> whereas uh, once you, down here in Devon, uh, they're all trout and uh, if, if you're so inclined salmon rivers as well but I, I just kind of go for the the uh, wild brownies. Do you have your certain spots that you want to share with anybody? Uh, well I mean I'm not sure if you'd take too much notice of what I'm doing because I put out tiddlers I mean they're like two ounce fish that are coming out with me. <laughs> no I only ask because I, I've got a buddy up here and uh, he's a ghillie and uh, like he, he, he's one of those kinds of persons that will blindfold you so you don't know where you're going. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, well, I mean, I might as well be blindfolded, quite frankly. Uh, <laughs> wherever, wherever I am, anywhere else, that's where I'd suggest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. He, he's a uh, he's teacher. I've gone three times, caught, caught something there all three times. Last time I actually took a picture because he didn't believe me. I caught anything. <laughs> it wasn't very big. It was maybe, you know, five inches six inches and uh so i was sitting there like playing my phone trying to keep the fish from coming out and then when i finally showed the picture and just laughed at me on how small it was and i was like come on man like i've only been Sorry, jason's life <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so uh he pulls he pulls his tiddler often 
Yeah, exactly. This is, this is a Saturday show. It's more game than the Friday night. <laughs> uh, with that in mind, it's time to get started. Uh, and before we do, um, we should uh, mention Bob Gibson, St. Louis Cardinals legend. Bob Gibson passed away. A uh, guy who won 251 games, uh, 2,170 strikeouts, and an ERA under three for his career. Um, 84 years old, Bob. What a legend and uh, RIP to him. So we've got something else to announce too. So right before we started, we got our 100th artist today. So we're now 100 for 100. So yeah. we got... Follow up the bad news with the good. That's good. I like to hear exactly. it. Exactly. So we got Eric Norton from Beckett Media when we did the live show. His yeah. son drew a picture of Cool, ba- cool Papa Bell during the Very show. Nice. And so, right. yeah. so his son is the 100th artist with us. Perfect. Uh, that's a nice note to start on. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, you're watching live or on demand. Uh, my name is John McKellar. I am a member of the Glasgow Comets baseball team in the Baseball Scotland National League. And I'm one half of the Ball Caps and Bagpipes podcast. Uh, normally, we podcast about Scottish baseball week to week. That hasn't been the case this year uh, due to COVID-19 suspending our season. But obviously, we, as uh, anyone who's been watching along will know, we've kind of looked into this fundraiser, the Negro League, Baseball Museum Art Fundraiser, and we're interviewing all the artists. We have a very talented guy, and he's an Englishman on the show this evening. Uh, to start, we've got three coming up again tonight. Uh, Jason, would you like to introduce yourself first off? I like it's not just Tim coming on; it's an Englishman. Not you just gonna throw that job out there right now. This is a friendly show here, and it, so <laughs> if it helps, John, my mum's Scottish. I didn't say anything negative. <laughs> I just said he's an English. He's just the first non-North American we've had on. <laughs> That's true. Anyways, I'm sitting there. I'm the other half of Ball Caps and Bagpipes, a former league president and Baseball Scotland Hall of Fame. I'm also the one of classics. And now I'll present you. Our and he's a and he's a prick as well. I <laughs> hope <laughs> Wow, we we've been on the air for like two minutes. We've gone downhill already. You know. This is good. <laughs> Tim, <laughs> welcome to the show. Right. Um, so, Tim, uh, you obviously have got a slightly different background than any of the artists that we've spoken to so far, being an Englishman yourself. Uh, you're over here in the UK. Um, but would you like to start by explaining to the listeners and viewers your baseball background? Uh, do you follow a particular team? Uh, you know, Do you play? And if so, to what level have you played in the past? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh... Well, I mean, I, I guess like most most uh, British people, um, it, there wasn't really any baseball when I was a kid. Um, but uh, I guess around about uh, the late 90s, um, when Channel 5 started to show baseball, um, my family and I also went over to America. So we bought baseball mitts and uh, bats and whatnot and came back and we were the only four, the only four kids in our rural Norfolk town that had baseball so we we knocked it about a bit and we you know we, we watched it, you know the time when Randy Johnson and whatnot were uh, were the kind of the big names so we we, we went the solar street sign and because nobody wants to be a catcher because we were wild and so we just put a metal street sign up against the tennis court, tennis court fence and that was our catcher and if you hit the if you hit the street sign it was a strike that was that was basically how it functioned um and and then that kind of um, that petered away, you know. Life got in the way. Baseball was not a just not a big cultural thing um, for for most most people over here. Um, and I guess it didn't really didn't really come about again until probably only three four years ago. Um, and I started watching kind of um, not obviously you know, Field of Dreams and whatnot. I'd seen before. Um, but I, it, it, from an illustration point of view, I've been doing a lot of um, First World War illustrations. Right. And I was getting a bit kind of, not, not tired, but kind of looking for another, another niche to, to explore. And I thought, actually, you know what? I, I, I fancy something like a, a sport, but I don't want to, you know, football in this country, there's, there's fan, so many fantastic football artists. Um, so I didn't initially go into that. Um, it was just that I thought, you know what, I like baseball as a kid. It's a bit quirky. I, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, but because of the, the kind of background to it really being feel the dreams <laughs> and then kind of looking around that uh, and 
with the kind of First World War interest, my baseball kind of education kind of started with the dead ball era stuff. I, I, you know, I, I've been watching the, 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 the rest of the guys coming on here and you're talking about all these players and I'm like, who the hell are they? Um, because that kind of, there's a whole period, um, really that whole junk wax era that, that, that Jason is so fond of. Um, I have no idea. I, there, obviously, there's like standout ones that you that you know that you you, you kind of pick up anyway. But the kind of anyone below that, I, I don't really know. But then on the other hand, I, I, you know, I'm still with with all of this stuff. You're always learning, aren't you? But you know, there's, I know a lot more about you know the the, the kind of uh, 1910s, 20s, and 30s era teams. Um, because that's that's where my interest has been, um, and that's most of my most of my art has has kind of tended to focus on that era. Even when I'm doing modern players, I'm putting that tens, twenties, thirties kind of spin on how I'm approaching. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, playing wise, I did briefly um, train with um, Norwich Iceni um, about three years ago. Um, when I, I moved back to Norfolk um, very briefly, um, I thought I was going to be there longer, and then I met my now wife, uh, and now I'm in Devon. Um, and actually, the, the, the southwest here obviously has quite a few teams, but where I am, I'm a good kind of two hours from any uh, any baseball team. I think there was one uh, meant to be set up in Biddeford, which is about half an hour from me, but I don't think it ever took off. Um, and that was before I arrived, anyway. Um, but n other than other than a few training sessions, no, not uh, I've not really played at all. Other than those, you know, you know as a kind of teenager um, in the park with my brothers, and then uh, and then a couple of it, everything else has been purely visual. So it's, it's funny the junk wax because I specifically bought the one pack, one box of modern cards for two artists in mind. You being the other one. <laughs> The other one, because I was like, he's going to have no idea who these guys are. <laughs> you could have at least got some Allen and Ginter ones or something, so they would have looked like the era that, you know. You know what those cost? I'm not a high budget show. I can't afford those <laughs> things. <laughs> I got like more than 10 pounds in a box of baseball cards. I get 36 packs. There's 15 cards a pack. I'm about to bang for my buck. So yeah. <laughs> next time we'll get together, we'll get a box for my buddy, and uh, we'll sit down and we can open them together, and you can go, yeah. I know. Guys. <laughs> so um you are we in the Giants jersey? Would you say that that's your team that you follow? No, it's not actually the Giants jersey is an homage um for Anika coming up next. I see. Um, for, for Anika and Ray, um who <laughs> I know outside of the outside of mm. the, the, this project as well. So I thought I'd I thought I'd I'd rep the Giants for them. Um partly because I was gonna wear my bleacher critic. Um t-shirt but it's in the wash so they got the Giants jersey instead um actually I'm a Red Sox fan um right. and have I've been it was, I guess it's the, the way with all these kind of if you support a team from this side of the pond it's just happenstance and I ended up supporting the Red Sox in that kind of the same way you end up supporting a football team you select it when you're a young kid and then you don't feel like you can change it yeah and I happened to um uh, I must have been about 10 or 11 and I collected tokens off the back of Golden Grahams and then you could send it in and you, could, you just chose the baseball cap you wanted and for some inexplicable reason I chose Boston Red Sox over the other three or four options that were on there mm -hmm. and then I kind of felt committed. No worries. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, do you have any particularly strong or favourite Boston Red Sox memories from watching uh, over the years? Um, well, I mean, it's been since I got back into the baseball, it's been uh, up and down <laughs> with the Red Sox. Obviously, there's been a World Series within it, but really either side of that, they've not really been competitive at all. Um, but I mean, the the, the World Series um, was the first year that my son was born as well, so that was quite a quite a kind of special special time. And actually, when he was when he was born. Uh, the day he was born, uh, the uh, Red Sox beat the Yankees 14-1. Uh, That's always a good day. 
yeah. And, and okay. the Red Sox actually sent me the tickets from the day from from Fenway. Oh, so yeah, I've, nice. got, I've got them framed, um, with, you know, with Dustin Pedroia on there, kind of. Yeah. Uh, uh, and yeah, just a uh, really nice little thing to have. And um, so that's, oh, yeah. that's quite special memories. And and to be honest, most of that most of that season, my memories are kind of intertwined with late night feeds mm -hmm. and using that as an excuse to go and yeah, oh, yeah, I've got to be up and feeding him. Oh, there's baseball on. Oh, that's all right then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, they kind of intertwined, and there were some. I mean, there were some astonishing games in that that season, the, the World Series season. Um, but yeah, they do kind of the the memory is as much about the family element of things yeah. as it is with the with the baseball. But, I mean, I have to say, really, that like the last I mean this season is very different anyway but even last season um I didn't watch anywhere near as much so uh, as I had been um partly tiredness because of the you know um young child yeah. um but actually my my interest in the subject is is predominantly historical and mm -hmm. it is um all, all that kind of broader cultural element of baseball within American society not not purely the sporting thing. Don't get me wrong. I like to sit down and uh, and watch a game as well, but I'm, I'm not kind of a die-hard fan with it. Um, it. It's more of an enjoyment. I, I will if I think the Red Sox matchup isn't really a traditional matchup that's on that night. I'll go and see what game is on where you know there's a couple of old franchises playing each other, <laughs> just yeah. just so I can feel a bit more transported into another world. You know that kind of cultural connection rather than sporting connection sort of cubs and cards sort of thing instead exactly, yeah exactly yeah right brilliant man well i don't know how much you listen to ball caps and bagpipes tin but uh my son was actually born earlier this year so right. i'm hoping that uh, lightning's gonna strike twice and uh, i'll be celebrating number 28 well, uh, <laughs> and, and, I, and i hope not unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair <laughs> um Jason, do you want to touch on the art side of things then? Yeah, we'll go into that at some point. So actually, I was going to ask if you wanted to come on Anika's interview and come jump in for a little bit. Yeah, can do. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you guys know each other, so I thought it'd be kind of a fun thing to get us all on and uh, let you guys chat and we can do something different where uh, you get you can ask some questions of Anika. I've got some fun ones all lined up in there. But yeah. you, 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 you well, can well, the, the main question I'd ask is how is she so good? Well, you, so that's funny you say that. One of my questions was going to be, well, let's see, let's see. You're uh, an illustrator, a writer, a designer, a cartoonist, humorous author. What's yeah. your kryptonite? Because what what can she do? I mean, I was obviously amazed when I was looking at her bio. So yeah, that, that's funny you mentioned that. So uh, that was definitely one of the things. Uh, she's so talented. And, and um, I was just looking at her, this is her work, and I'm sure it's only a fraction of what we see on there. And uh, I'm just absolutely blown away. Yeah, uh, it, it, it is it kind of getting into the baseball art. Um, I just kind of stumbled across Anika one day. Um, I think it was uh, it would have been about the same time that she um, she released her first book. Um, was it Principle of the Curve? Yes. The 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 one of all her illustrations, and it just, it just kind of happened to fall in, and then you know we we kind of buddied up. Um, and then as it turned out, you know, her, her partner is over here a fair bit. Um, so I've met up with him and, and it's been, yeah, it's been really, really nice kind of that, that community spirit that a few of the other artists have spoken about. It's just really, really lovely that you, you know, whenever I've got in touch with any, any, um, baseball artist, uh, you know, and, and said, you know, oh, really love your stuff then the conversation begins. There's no kind of prima donnas. There's no kind of what, well, not that I've come across yet anyway, they may well be out there, but uh, I've not come across any at all. We've been really kind of friendly and supportive and encouraging as well. Um, so uh, coming from the UK, you're reaching out to the other artists. How are you generally received? Do they kind of see you as an oddity? And like, hey, there's some British dude out here that likes my work or are they more kind of, Curious about, again, like us going, how'd you get into baseball and stuff like that? Because again, like it's one of the first questions most people ask me and go, you play baseball in Scotland? There's just baseball in Scotland. So from an artist's perspective, I'm curious how it works for you. Well, I mean, if I'm honest, most um, most people that get in touch with me or if I get in touch with them first, um, don't realize I am 
British. That they they assume I'm American, and probably you, know, you can understand why. Um, and it's only kind of when when you get into it, they're like, "What you? But you're American who lives over there now, are you? No, no, I'm I'm from here, born here. You know, just kind of got into it. Um, but I, I've I've had it with um, you know exhibitions over in America as well, where they kind of get in touch and say, "We'd really like to have your work." Oh, yeah, great, no problem. Um, let me know when you need it by, because I need to send it from Britain. Oh, I didn't realise that. <laughs> so, yeah. so yes, I didn't. I was starting to look into the baseball's art exhibition that held happens in Shelby, North Carolina, which obviously you set your work chart. I didn't realise it's been going since 2010. Yeah, I, I've only done it the once uh, uh, last year. But yeah, I mean that that um, that really is. There's some just incredible artists there. You, you kind of see your work there and you think, oh, and to be honest, throughout this, um, throughout these interviews as well, you can't help but there's a bit of imposter syndrome comes in. You're like, oh, I, just, I feel like I just kind of fell into baseball and, and, and started, you know, drawing it and illustrating it. And, and then these guys, it's like the worlds, you know, they know, they know things inside out. And I'm like, well, I just kind of go and look things up. And then I draw it. It's not like off the back of my head. I go, oh, well, I'll draw this obscure. But, or someone that I feel is obscure. I mean, I've had it where I, I've drawn someone who I think is obscure. And I think, oh, nobody will have heard of that. And I go, here's this illustration of Rogers Hornsby. <laughs> and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I know him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you ever thought maybe, well, obviously yeah. Uh, look at their stats first. <laughs> okay, this guy's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> yeah. well, <laughs> maybe I should. I I tend to, if I'm honest, I tend to get kind of a an image, or not so much now, now that I'm a bit more versed in it, but at the kind of in the earlier days, I'd get an image of right, what kind of action do I want to be portraying? And then I'd go and track down a uniform that I liked. And then I'd find a play within that uniform that would potentially be doing the action that I wanted to illustrate. Um, and so it was a kind of, that who I drew was pure kind of chance in that respect. Um, and, and not having that kind of um, cultural education in it, you know, not growing up with a grandfather or a father who's shown me old baseball cards or anything like that. Um, because you know, not many people do in this country. To be fair, um, there's gonna be more pictures of Ted Williams than, than whoever was the, the fifth man, the 25th man on the bench for the Red Sox. You know, mm. <laughs> there's only so many times you you know have a guy like uh, carrying the, the bats back to the dugout. You know, because obviously the stars gonna have more pictures. So I imagine yeah. it's more reference material for you. Yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, you know, when when I started out, I kind of I really got I was really interested in the in the the. Um, the, the drawing the bigger name just to try and kind of make a name for myself as much as anything else, you know, kind of get it out there. Um, but as uh, as I've kind of got more versed in in the game and in the history of the game, um, you know, the interest kind of goes off in different directions, doesn't it? So you, you know, things like the Pacific Coast leagues and stuff like that, I, you know, they're they're fascinating that these things kind of existed and then they just kind of absorb or dissipate or whatever these other leagues do uh, and and they're the kind of areas that if if i'm pursue if i'm doing the bit of art that i want to do i tend to pursue something that i still perceive as a slightly kind of niche version of niche because yes baseball is niche for an english artist but my audience is predominantly on across the atlantic uh, and baseball is not niche then it's a you know, it's a, it's kind of central to the, the, the kind of American spirit in some respects. Uh, and so you, you kind of trying to dial in on even niche versions of that thing, which then when I have to talk to someone over in this country, normally, um, they're like, isn't that rounders? Uh, I've had that before. I used to get it a lot at work. Yeah. Oh, you play rounders tonight? <laughs> okay, so before we move on to the next question, we keep chatting here. No one knows, no one's watching it, doesn't know what rounders is. And, and so you guys will have to explain rounders to the audience. 
I don't play rounders, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I played it two or three times at school, and I think that was it. It was. Yeah, like no one actually plays rounders. I don't know where that whole thing comes from. It's a one-handed thing, isn't it? And it's a much smaller bat. It's about that long. Possibly, yeah, because it was. And it's only yeah. one-handed, and I think it's underarm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I don't know about you, Tim, but in high, in high school, we didn't play rounders. We played softball in high school rather than rounders. So, like, I don't know where this whole kind of right, fixation on rounders comes from. This might be the English-Scottish divide. I played cricket, obviously. Cricket? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't play cricket so much in Larrickshire. Uh, it's mostly, well, our high school was kind of odd for our area. Our area is very football-focused, but um, the head of PE in our school was not a fan of football at all, so it was just rugby. It was rugby or nothing. So like every every other school in our like district had like a rugby and a football team. And all the kind of players who or the guys who wanted to be athletes and stuff like that would go play football. So right. it was kind of everyone who else else who was left would play rugby. But in our school it was like if you wanted to do athletics it was rugby. And that yeah. was it. Um which was kind of shit because I love football and hate rugby. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, uh, were you much of a cricketer back in the day? I was terrible, terrible cricketer. <laughs> uh, I used to, play, you, you play along, don't you? Um, and I used to play football and, uh, and rugby as well, um, but ne never very well. Um, more for just the kind of team experience, I suppose. Um, but uh, once you kind of, I, I play, when I finished um, art school, I, I moved over to Germany and I played uh, rugby over there for a couple of years um, but then when I came back I played a couple of times for some uh, you know kind of course rugby um, and played some you know kind of power league football and stuff like that and and I've been, you're, you're now talking 10 years ago for for anything like that so my most recent kind of um, organized sport was training with Norwich Iceni. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? I actually have no idea I've seen them called but what is Nicene? I see. He was the tribe that were that were in East Anglia during the the kind of uh, Roman occupation, right. and they were they were led by um, uh, a, a kind of tribal queen called Boudica, who led the revolt against the the, the Romans, and so the Iceni is a kind of a the tribal name for the area. Ah, okay, yeah, because it's one of those things where I see them pop up, and I should ask the question. But now I've seen it for so long, I'm too embarrassed to ask the question. <laughs> so, I, could ju I could just picture you, Jason, like, what is an ice knife? <laughs> <laughs> I would have pronounced it Iceni, but yeah. <laughs> um, Tim, you, in addition to being a baseball fan and an illustrator and an artist, you're a, an avid collector of alcoholic drinks um, and beverages. Uh, <laughs> would you like to would you like to touch on your collection? Obviously you've mentioned off here before we got started that all those in the you know, shelf behind you, that's just the bourbons. Um, yeah. how, how many drinks do you have in your collection? Uh, and how old there's, is your oldest probably, one? There's probably uh, about 25 bourbons up there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've probably got about 40 single malts as well. Um, and to be honest, it's something um, um, one of my brothers and uh, a couple of mates. We uh, we started our own little whiskey club. Um, yeah. whew, can't think when it was, 10, 15 years ago maybe. Uh, and we were we were quite good at it when we first started. Um, we we had a little notebook and we used to kind of set thematic evenings. And then you'd go out and you'd buy your buy your whiskies for the evening, yeah. um, uh, and you know, compare and contrast, and you'd set a menu to the whiskies and everything like that. Nice. Um, and then, with me being down in Devon now, it makes it a bit more awkward. Um, but, uh, yeah, kind of the, the enjoyment of the supping on a, either a bourbon or a single malt, particularly when it starts to get to this time of year, when it's a bit, uh, a bit chillier. Mm -hmm. It's quite nice to have something to kind of warm the cockles. Yeah, so we're seeing the same thing. Tim posted the, his uh, first picture of a of this porter when it was about two or three weeks ago there and i was like yep it's the season i do the exact same thing it's like it's just a little bit colder now you need to kind of a nice warm drink to go with it um, yeah absolutely um yeah because i still have my whiskey i still haven't bottled that yet so oh, right yeah 
Um, I need to go and find a distributor for it. I was kind of hoping post lockdown I can go actually talk to the guy to do that. But uh, yeah, we'll make sure you get the bottle down that way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I'll come up and we can do some fishing as well. Oh yeah. Well, let's see. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll gift you a couple extra bottles and we get an illustration on there. We got to do some kind of collaboration because it's the only thing I can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sounds like my kind of job. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Um, <laughs> we're going off topic. I love this. And I can chat for hours with you, Tim, because we've done it before. You know, we met <laughs> series and I came up to go visit you. But I want to touch on uh, your other work because you have got your doctorate. Congratulations. Thank you. But can you tell us more about what it is? And I think this really kind of ties in with your work, just the area, so the, the I guess the years, the period that you do it from. Oh, oh, the doctorate are you talking about? Yeah, I was talking about how you do the Great War and everything like that there, so. Yeah, so the, the kind of, the way I got into the, uh, into the illustration in, in general, um, actually is directly connected to the, the PhD um, because I was, when I did my postgrad, um, I was doing it um, part time. So I was um, working during the day um, at the local council, uh, and then travelling into London of an evening and doing and doing the, the course. And then once I'd done that, um, it was kind of suggested that I go and do a PhD. Uh, and I was very fortunate that I got funded to do my PhD, which meant that I could quit my day job. Um, so when I got uh, the funding to do that I thought well actually here's an opportunity I'm being paid to do the thing that I was doing in my spare time so whilst it's a bit of a you, you, there, there isn't a great deal of spare time in a PhD but you do still find other time and I thought you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna do some illustrations um just to kind of give me a creative outlet because you know with obviously in those early days of a PhD you are reading reading and reading and reading and doing a bit of writing and then reading a lot more. Uh, and so I, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate and I decided to illustrate the, the, the First World War um, to kind of keep my brain in the, in the space of what I was reading about, but to give me that creative outlet. Uh, and then um, after, um, after a few months of that, a friend of mine um, said, uh, you know, these are actually these aren't bad. You should you know, really should share these with people. I think people would like them. And so I set up a blog and then before I knew where I was at, kind of people were kind of getting in touch and trying to buy the works and, uh, and commissioning me to do other works. Uh, and by the time I eventually ended my PhD, obviously the bulk of my, I'm a full-time, I, I call myself an illustrator, but if I'm honest, probably in the purest terms, I'm, I'm an artist. And because most of the most of the work that I do ends up being one offs that people buy to go on their wall. They don't I, I, I tend to refer to myself as an illustrator because of the way I approach the uh, approach the, the kind of pieces. I'm, I'm not doing some kind of modern day political commentary with what I'm doing. It is trying to capture a snapshot of something from the past, effectively. Um, be that the First World War, be it baseball, be it football, whatever, whatever the subject is um so uh yeah that's that's kind of how I, I ended up getting into the, the illustration and the first world war side of things was was a kind of counterpoint to the the, the intensity of reading all day and um, doing the phd that's really cool yeah and no, i just wanted to touch on that because i know i've seen your work I, you post all your stuff it's really awesome and um, i wanted to make sure you get a shout out for that as well because i don't Talk about the sport work, but I want to give everyone else's work a chance to talk about that. So. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things I do find, and I'm sure others that have kind of multiple interests. It's really difficult in the kind of social media world, where there's a certain kind of fickleness. It seems with interest, and um, so when, when you like myself, if you've got multiple interests, and you you still are actively engaged in all those interests and you share the, the kind of output of those interests. Well, if I share, I don't know, for a couple of weeks, I'm really involved in First World War stuff and that's what's coming out on my feeds. I can guarantee you, I lose baseball followers, or, you know, and, and vice versa. Um, it's just the, the nature of it, kind of trying to juggle what I want to be doing uh, and 
knowing that oh yeah but i need to keep these other people interested uh, and you know I, i'm a kind of i'm a faddish kind of guy i i i go through phases of when you know of intense interest in something and then it fades a bit while the next intense interest arrives but they're always kind of the same interest there's always a cycle i always come back to them but the times the times of year i always find when it starts to get colder outside my mind shifts from baseball uh, and it's kind of drifts back across to the western front again uh, and I, I find myself kind of drawing that kind of thing um sometimes sometimes when it's uh, uh this kind of time of year uh, the football as well comes into it but um yeah i i I'm just not feeling the football art at the moment, but that's not to say I won't again in the future. It's just just one of those things, as I say, it kind of ebbs and flows as to to what I'm what I'm doing and what interests me. Yeah. Would you say a lack of atmosphere uh, caused by the you know there's no fans in football matches? Would you say that lack of atmosphere caused by COVID has maybe maybe mm, contributed not, to that or not really? No, because it's the same same thing with the football. I don't tend to draw modern stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it tends to be more. Um, um, kind of, uh, older things, but I think one of the one of the um, big changes in uh, in all across all my art um, in the last um, year or so is I was conscious that I was drifting more and more towards kind of digital art, um, and I, I was feeling a disconnect um, with what I was doing and what I was outputting, um, and so I've made a kind of conscious effort. To pull that back into kind of actual paintings and you know physical art, art that I start with a blank canvas or page or whatever, and I when it's finished I can hold it up and look at it and go, I did that rather than it being this kind of series of you know ones and zeros on a screen somewhere that that look nice. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's some beautiful stuff out there, um, but I was finding I was I was drifting towards that and. In, in the art world, you know, you have to keep your, um, you, you have to keep an identity. And I was finding that I was trying to change my art too much to fit in with what I thought people wanted rather than produce the art that I enjoy producing. Um, and so that's been a kind of conscious thing over the last year. And because most of my football work was digital, um, it's meant I've not really, not really done much football work. Um, but the baseball stuff, I've really kind of got back into it again with um, with with the painting because I just again one of the things I love about the the the, um, the, the kind of era of baseball that I, I enjoy are, are the adver uh, advertisements uh, and the stadiums and, and going off and doing all the the research uh, into right. Well, if I'm going to paint it from this angle, what billboard can you see, and what part of the stadium can you see, and what angle is that going to do, and what position is that? So, where would the sunlight be at this particular time of day, and you know all these kind of things. Um, that that's part of the part of the fun of it, and then being able to articulate that with a paintbrush is far more enjoyable to me than selecting green and going yeah, and now I'll just stick a texture on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Tim, in your, uh, in your studies of that era, the dead ball era, um, have you come across a favourite story from back then? Um, I don't think I really... I, the trouble is for me, I don't really look at the stories. I don't, I don't really... It's probably it's a, it's not a particularly good uh, advert for me, uh, but I, I tend to kind of... I tend to look around the baseball. The baseball is... I'm painting baseball... But actually, the thing that kind of interests me is the bit going on around the baseball. Um, uh, and so I'm finding that, uh, you know, not many of my um, works in progress are, are out there at the moment. But there, there's a lot more focus on the stadium and the, the, the context of the baseball, rather than it being, A, another player. Um, and, you know, with, with the best one in the world, painting baseball there's a there's a certain kind of uh, limitation to some extent as to the the the, the physical motions that a player is going to go through yeah. um although there is an, an element to it when you're when you're painting kind of historic stuff particularly because i don't i don't paint photographs um i 
I obviously use the photographs as reference, but I tried to kind of reimagine um, a, a certain game as, uh, uh, and a kind of scene that must have happened, but that there isn't a visual record of it, um, or certainly one that I've been able to find. Um, so you kind of using the reference points and then recreating something. Uh, and I, I enjoy that as well. And I do that with the First World War stuff. Um, um, but yeah, the, the kind of contextual thing is a, is a really a really strong driver. So the, the, so the stories, are, it's not really, it, it doesn't really, I'm sure that if I'd really thought about it, I'd, there are some in there, but I couldn't say I have a favorite one. Well, we were running out of time. We got two minutes for it. But uh, what I want to know is, I said, what are you doing for the Negro League fundraiser? I know I've seen everything, but let's tell everyone else uh, what you've done. So I've um, I've done a new um, painting of Leon Day, um, who uh, actually, because it's Negro Leagues, I put him in a Negro Leagues uniform. But actually, my interest is in his uh, role in the uh, 1945. Um, um, GI World Series, um, uh, and, and that was kind of how I um, kind of found out about him. Uh, in fact, there's another um, another um, chap who lives in Glasgow um, who writes the Baseball in Wartime um, magazine, um, and he had written about him. Uh, and I kind of got interested in that. And then I thought, ah, but it is a Negro Leagues thing. I can't very well put him in his service uniform. So I had a look into it. And of course, the Newark Eagles in 1946 uh, win the World Series, or the Negro League World Series. Um, although he, Leon Day doesn't have a particularly um, great showing. Um, but I wanted to paint Leon Day. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I actually decided to um, put him in in game seven when he... He pitches so badly in the first innings, really gets knocked about. Um, I he might even ship five runs, I can't remember, but he does get knocked about in that first inning. So he gets moved to centre field for the rest of the game. Um, and so I painted him in centre field at, um, at uh, oh, I think Rupert, Rupert Park, Rupert, Rupert Stadium, Rupert Stadium. Um, uh, and so it was that kind of tracking, tracking that down. So I've done the painting. Uh, and the, the the painting's already sold, so that's that was a good start. <laughs> um, um, uh, and then there are prints um, available of that as well. Um, but I've also taken some of the other um, Negro League um, players that I've I've painted. So I've done um, a Josh Gibson, the Holmes Grays, uh, and I've done a an Ernie Banks when he uh, turned out for the uh, the Monarchs. Um, and I've converted those into a kind of um, art cards. Um, so, like, here's a, yeah, here's one of the, I don't know if you can see that one particularly well. There's yeah. the yeah. George Gibson one. Um, just kind of, yeah. yeah, with a little, like a limited edition numbering on the back. Um, awesome, um, so, yeah, they're, they're going out, the three of those. Uh, and I've also then put... Um, on the Negro League badge and all the other anything else on my site so any, effectively anything which is I, I've created a kind of little um, subsection on the website um, that if it sells in, in that period then the 20% goes off to the off to the museum so yeah that's that's what I'm kind of that's, that's what I'm offering for this uh, and uh, obviously a set of the cards are on their way to you as well Jason for the for the raffle Absolutely. Thank you so much for the donation. I can't wait. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing them. There might be one less. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God, there were three in this. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, you want to ask your question and we'll open up some cards and then yep. uh, we'll get ready for Anika and we'll surprise her because unless she's watching this episode, she doesn't know your comments. So. <laughs> So uh, we like to close all of our interviews uh, with the same question, Tim, uh, you being an Englishman rather than an American, I'll uh, rephrase it slightly. Um, as an artist and as a baseball historian, what do the Negro Leagues mean to you? You've been watching the show, so you knew this question was coming. So you've had time yeah, to I, I did, <laughs> and I thought, what am I going to answer? Um, because I... 
having come to baseball history and, and baseball in general quite late, one of the earliest Twitter feeds I found was the Negro Leagues Museum. Uh, and so almost from the start of my kind of learning of the baseball journey, the Negro Leagues were part of that. Um, and so it is quite odd kind of coming from that position to think they were never like that. I mean, it's, it's bizarre to think of them in the first place existing. Um, but um, yeah, it's, so it, the, the question is quite, I can't really answer the question in the same way that all the other kind of viewers have. I mean, it, like th there've been a number of, a uh, number of other, other kind of um, uh, artists that, you know, weren't necessarily even aware of the museum, etc. cetera, um, before the project started. Whereas, as I say, for me, it was one of the various, very earliest kind of um, Twitter feeds that I that I, I, I followed, uh, and um, yeah, so it's it's kind of it's always been part of baseball history for me. <laughs> um, so I, I can't really kind of so and again in, in the art sense, I think it's been a part of my art from when I started. I didn't kind of suddenly go, oh, there was an Negro League as well. Oh, well, I'll do some of that. Um, but I, you know, I think it, there's been a few times when, but one of the things I've done is um, um, take modern day players and put them on cracker jet cards. Um, and of course, the Negro Leagues didn't have or weren't represented on the cracker jet cards. Um, so there are people on those cracker jet cards that I made that wouldn't have made it onto the original ones. And that has that's driven quite a lot of comment from the other side of the, the Atlantic. Um, and in some respects, I think because we have a very different, not a very different, but a, you know, a substantially different um, uh, understanding of uh, race uh, and the makeup of it in this country, uh, as opposed to in America, I, I still kind of get taken aback at some of the things that I read and, and learn about the Negro Leagues and, and the kind of the approach to it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and it baffles me that the history has been kind of segregated as well for for so long, and and it's really the work of the, the museum uh, and uh, Bob Kendrick and uh, and others to to kind of really kind of raise it within America that, that there was this thing going on. Um, you know, it didn't just start with Jackie Robinson. There was, you know, there was other stuff going on as well. So, yeah, so um, didn't really answer it, but yeah, get <laughs> we really uh, you know, you, you were over here, you know, like I said, it's, it's not the same kind of historical background you would have growing up yeah. there. A, a lot of people go, Well, I knew of it, and then, um, uh, the, the Ken Burns documentary came out and it you know, shed more light onto it, and that's kind mm -hmm. of, I mean, for me, it's the same way. Like, I, I knew of it, and then I watched, you know, the documentary and went, Oh my gosh, there's more in information about it and that was a lot of people's first chance to see something like that yeah yeah well yeah i i, I guess if, if there was suddenly a kind of a television program telling me that there was a negro football league in britain in the early 20s and 30s i'd be shocked mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um but yeah it is it kind of i wouldn't say it's anathema but it does feel very uh, it jars quite, quite strongly that it even existed that there was such a thing because it, I don't think it. I'm not saying that uh, the British kind of a, approach to race has always been great, but I, I'm not sure that would have. And there are examples, you know, the the, the Portsmouth footballer, his name, flips, uh, Plymouth footballer, Jack. They're, they're, they're doing the. Uh, I can't remember what his name is Jack. Someone. Um, they're looking at raising the statue for who was the. Um, he's called up for England, and when they found out he's black, they rescinded the call up. So there is, there is kind of that that element of there, and it's you know there are obviously barriers, but I don't. It's not the same type of barrier as a segregated league. Mm -hmm. um, so it's yeah, it's been, it's it just yeah. I think it it does it leaves me a bit dumbfounded, and it's quite kind of. I, the concept kind of leaves me unable to kind of really understand the situation. 
Right, so, so guys, uh, we're running out of time here. I just want to quickly point out Tad is watching, Tad Richardson, and he wants to uh, make sure he's in the right place. He's looking for the Beards and Baseball webcast. You're in the right place, Tad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Tad follows up by saying, cheers, Tim, and uh, he loves your work. Um, so, Thanks, Tim. Uh, we're going to crack a pack and open some cards here quickly. Uh, before we do, do you want to quickly plug your uh, social media and website? Yeah, so you can uh, find my work and other nonsense on uh Instagram and Twitter, and they're both the same, which is TJ Godden, which is G-O-D-D-E-N. And then you can find my shop and either from the links in uh, uh, Instagram or Twitter, or you can go to timgoddenillustrations.bigcartel.com. Perfect. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Tim. Uh, Jason, let's crack a pack and open some cards. All right. Should we just go to the modern one so you don't have to go through the whole thing? No, I mean, just, just go for it, yeah. <laughs> Although, I wouldn't have minded seeing you eat some more of that gum again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm all out. There's no chances. <laughs> all... What are the chances? What are the chances? It's all gum today. It's all gum today. <laughs> Uh, I think I've eaten pretty much all of the gum in every pack. I think I've only skipped like one pack so far. So, um, <laughs> and, and funny enough, I still have it. I haven't touched it yet. <laughs> <It's still there. laughs> so I'm not gonna eat that card, and uh, we'll be okay. All right. So we'll go with modern because of that. So we started off with Hunter Dozier of the Royals. He's yeah. formerly of the Twins, right? Uh. No, he's a royal. I think you're thinking of Brian Dozier. Brian Dozier, there you go. Okay. So we I'm have, a Yankees fan. We don't care about other clubs. We have the big league best, American League innings pitch best. So apparently that, that's something you celebrated that you threw the most innings. Is that Kim these days, I mean, these days pitching a lot of innings without Tommy John uh, is, a, <laughs> is a bit of an achievement. So, yeah. <laughs> we got a Chris Bryant card. So that's pretty cool. Nice. All right, yeah, so at least we like that. know a few of the guys here. Let's see what else we got. Oh, the 2019 home run leader, leaders. Who do you know? Who was the home run leader from last year? Do you know? Mike Trout. No, he's in there. He's the middle guy. He hit 45. Uh, Christian Yelich hit a lot of home runs last year. But I don't yeah, know if he's so it was Jorge Soler. So okay. I didn't even know that. <laughs> How many did he hit? Like 49. 48, yeah. I, 48. I have no idea in that. So, okay. Uh, here we go. We've got Anthony Rendon for the okay. Angels. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, they got him in the Angels uniform and up in that uniform. And um, that obviously was a classic film. Um, Angels in the Outfield. That was, one yeah. of, that was one of the films <laughs> that I remember as a kid. Yeah. About <laughs> All right. We've got some crazy roll call. Our, our Atiti is a Kino card. Okay, so um, that's an ugly card. I'm sorry, I don't I like that. Hit, I think you hit a lot of home runs last year. Like I said, I, like the modern game, I'm not really following and I don't really watch it. <laughs> but we've got a Lord Guriel Jr. card. This is like one of these uh, uh, parallel cards that come out, they turn in orange for these ones. So we've got Cardinal first baseman Paul Goldschmidt, right? Yeah. Strong player, solid, solid guy, man. Yeah. Excellent. So, and uh, Texas He's Ranger. He's my Diamond Dynasty first baseman, actually, Paul Goldschmidt. All right. Name the show. Texas Ranger Joey Gallo. And our final card is an Albert Pujols becomes Mr. 2000 card. Not bad. Right. Not a bad finish. So, yeah, I mean, at least we got a couple good cards in there. We have the Pujols and whatnot. All right, well, let's go take a five-minute bathroom break, and uh, yeah. we'll come back on. Tim, if you just use that same link before, I'll get you right back in. Same thank one. You, thank you. And if not, thank you for that, so. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Tim. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll catch you on the flip side. And we need to get you on ball caps and bagpipes again to delve further into your uh, your research. And, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, after the fact, and how well your stuff does in the fundraising. Yeah. All right, Tim, see you in five. See ya. Bye.